opportunity to ask. Uh oh, I just got the prompt that this meeting is being recorded, so I, I am. Type. I'm gonna I'm gonna record this, and everybody's gonna get an email in their inbox on Friday with this whole deck, the recording, everything you're gonna need. So you don't need to pause and take pictures, etc. We'll have it all in your inbox. Yeah, I, uh, I I I was like, should I leave this meeting? Should I not leave this meeting? But I figure I should, since I'm the the guest here, I should probably stick around. <laughs> but um, got to tighten up the salty language for the rest of the presentation here. So. Okay, so taking a look here at Sony Home Cinema Projectors for 2021, uh, that's really the focus of this presentation. But uh, again, we do have the uh, options open for Q&A here during the session, as well as the end, we'll, uh, we'll try to get through it so we've got enough time to uh, get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, so if it's something Sony related that I can answer, uh, that's not a philosophical question or something for, uh, you know, upper management to answer if it's related to uh, custom installed products, TVs, projectors, AV receivers, etc. Uh, we can incorporate that. But the focus of this presentation is all about the new home cinema projector products that we brought to market. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the technology that's cooked into Sony. Uh, we have some comparison slides versus some of our competitors out there. So we'll take a look at some of the new features, we'll take a deeper dive into some of the technology and try to arm you guys with as much information so that when you go out there and you're making uh, pitches to clients and you're making presentations to them about what the options are for them uh, in the custom install space and certainly with projectors, uh, you have as much information as you possibly will need uh, to be successful in that and hopefully answer a bunch of those questions. So uh, the agenda for today is to take a look at the FY20 products and some of the awards and recognition that we've gotten there. We'll talk about some of the new models that we've introduced here just uh, earlier last month, the first week of May. Uh, we'll take an overall view of the complete Sony projector lineup, 10 models strong now, which is crazy. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the comparisons that we talked about. And of course, there will be time for Q&A throughout this presentation. So if I say something, you hear something, you have a question you want to ask during the session, throw it up in the chat and I'll make sure to do my best to answer it. Okay, so taking a look at uh, the models that we introduced last year at our virtual CD event in San Diego. I don't know what you guys were doing in September uh, of last year, but I know I was at a conference room in San Diego at Sony headquarters that uh, rep, you know, really replicated what we would do for a booth tour at Cedia um, and, you know, obviously presented it virtually. So uh, during those sessions, of course, we launched three new projector models, uh, the 715ES, 915ES, and of course the flagship GTZ 380. Uh, if there's some questions out there, is Sony going to be at Cedia this year? Uh, as far as I know, I'm planning for it right now. Uh, there will be a physical show in Indianapolis and Sony will be there. Uh, there may also be a virtual component tied to what we're doing like we did last year, just to try to make sure that everybody gets a chance to participate and see the latest and greatest. But um, kind of getting that news out of the way and that little bit out of the way, uh, we got a lot of press and a lot of uh, recognition for the new products that we brought to market last year. 715 ES, you know, wins a best of the best a year uh, award for Projector Central. You know, we get uh, in for, excuse me, getting recognition from projector reviews, impact awards, CE Pro best of class, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Sony projectors, quite frankly, uh, I know I work for Sony, but we really are the the class of the field in in, in a lot of respects, right? So we're getting that well-renowned Sony image quality, well-renowned Sony build quality, and we're offering them at competitive price points with lots of dealer margin in it for our partners out there. So if you port, support Sony, uh, you know that you're also gonna be making a little bit of extra cheddar uh, on the deal, which is again, why we're all here, right? So taking a look uh, beyond some of the industry awards that we've gotten, we've also gotten some uh, accolades from the cinematography and the Hollywood side of things uh, Mr. Claudio Miranda is a cinematographer that's responsible for some movies like uh, Oblivion, Tron Legacy, Life of Pi, and the upcoming Top Gun Maverick film. Um, unless you're friends with Tom Cruise, you haven't seen Top Gun Maverick, but chances are you've probably seen some of these other films that are listed there. Um, and if you haven't, you should take a look at them because uh, Mr. Miranda has a, a unique sensibility, I would say, when it comes to cinematography uh, and really telling a story with big pictures. So his set pieces are usually um, very large, very grandiose to really trying to set the scale and the size of the um, 
of the story that we're talking about here. The stage is huge usually with his content. So when we take a look at um, some of the initiatives that uh, his industry and his counterparts have uh, taken under their wing, they're really looking for ways to reproduce what customers are seeing down the street at the AMC and the Regal theaters in terms of performance, uh, obviously in customers' homes. The movie industry in general has obviously <laughs> had a pretty wild and dramatic shift here with, you know, first day releases streaming online at the same time that they're in the theater and, and other situations like that, right? So that sort of mindset or sort of that being the reality of all of this, people still probably want to have that large screen experience when they're watching uh, a movie like the ones listed here, right? These are, these are epics. These are, you know, very grandiose stories and you should have a large grandiose image. Mr. Miranda is a big fan of Sony projector, specifically our laser projector product line delivers on the black level and the things that he's looking for as well as the color gamut. So Sony did not pay him uh, to give us that review. This is actually done through a uh, independent, uh, shall we say independent organization within uh, the Hollywood uh, Screen Actors Guild as well as Directors Guild and stuff like that. So they're uh, looking for ways to expand the reach of that theater experience. And Mr. Miranda is a big fan of Sony projectors. So I don't, uh, I don't have anywhere near the clout or uh, experience uh, with a camera as uh, my, 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 uh, my esteemed colleague here, Mr. Claudio Miranda is holding the Oscar there. So I think he's done pretty well for himself. Uh, so if people are saying, you know, why Sony versus something else, you know, it's really recognized by the industry, not only on the production side of things, but Sony is also well recognized by the industry on the uh, broadcast and the representation side of things. So again, how do you get your movie that you've spent five or six or maybe seven years putting together to look as good as it possibly can on the theater screen, as well as in a customer's home? Using Sony products is a great way to uh, recreate that experience. Taking a look at the new product uh, that we've introduced here just a few weeks ago uh, in the early part of May. So I, these new boxes aren't even a month old yet. So still pretty much uh, hot off the presses and new information. And again, the agenda here is to really talk about what the new models are because they're really iterations of the models that they replace. But we'll take a deeper dive into the technology and try to give you guys some tidbits of information to use. Again, when we're talking to customers, you're thinking about system design. If you're familiar with our product lineup from last year, uh, of course, we had those three new models introduced, Sub-15, 915, and GTZ 380. Uh, but you're also probably familiar with the other uh, usual suspects here in our lineup. Of course, the 295ES, 995ES, and VW 5000. So, you know, when I think back about my time at Sony, when I started with the company almost a decade ago, uh, we had two projectors in our lineup um, <clears throat> and, you know, they were HD and they were pretty good, but, you know, there were a whole lot of other um, entities out there in the projector space that were grabbing all the headlines. Um, fast forward the clock here, you know, again, almost 10 years, and most of those competitors have pretty much dried up, if not completely disappeared off the map. Uh, and the face of the game has changed. Sony is well and truly established as, you know, the lead, you know, one of the leaders, if not the leader of the home cinema projector market. So we've got a lot of different options across the lineup and a lot of different price points uh, there to consider. So when we take a look at the new models that we're introducing, there's a couple of new features that come along with it. Also some new price points to consider there as well. So taking a look at where we are for FY21, two new models that we've introduced for this year, are the VW 325ES there is our foundation level product at $5,500 retail. And we've replaced the 995ES with the new 1025ES with a new price point of $40,000. So <clears throat> obviously those are, you know, increases in price and, you know, generally uh, the, the rule of thought or the rule of thumb is that, you know, hey, we're going to see uh, prices decrease over time, year over year over year, because that's what happens with commodities, right? Um, the reason that we're seeing some price increases here is probably a few fold it costs a whole lot more these days to make uh, projectors, semiconductors and things like that obviously are in short supply. And we're seeing that impact across many industries, not just AV. Uh, I believe there's, you know, <laughs> I believe there's a parking lot somewhere in Kentucky that's got, you know, close to 10,000 Ford pickup trucks sitting in it waiting for simple components to complete those, uh, to complete those builds. So, 
if we sort of take a look at that and extrapolate sort of where we're at with Sony, um, Sony does not buy any of our product or any of our technology off the shelf. It's all developed in house. So again, unlike a lot of our competitors out there that are buying devices that are OEM'd for them, uh, Sony's building all of this stuff under our guidelines, under our rule of thought, and there is no sister model. There is no, oh, I can buy brand X and it's the same thing as a Sony, right? So it costs more to do that. Um, so we're seeing some price increases across uh, some of these new models here. The VW325 goes up $500 from $5,000 to $5,500. And the 1025, which is the replacement for the 995 ES, goes from 35000 to $4,000 or $40,000, excuse me. So obviously those are, you know, significant price jumps relative to the spaces that we play in. Um, but again, if you're having a $5,000 conversation with a customer you know, about a projector, hopefully $500 isn't a, a make or break deal for you. And certainly if we're talking about a 1025 uh, ES projector, uh, versus a 995, it's a $5,000 dearer ask. But let's let's just kind of be honest here. Let's just put it all out there where it is. If you're having a conversation about a $35,000 or $40,000 home entertainment device with a client, uh, chances are, by and large, $5,000 isn't gonna be a make or break deal there, right? Um, probably one of the least expensive things that they're considering uh, with the rest of the scale of their home, et cetera. Of course, there are always outliers and people are always looking for the best deal possible. But again, taking a look at the global situation with uh, parts and chips availability, et cetera, on top of the fact that Sony is, again, not bought off the shelf. We're building it all in-house. Just costs a little bit more to make these things today. It costs a little bit more to ship them. And uh, we've increased the price as a result. What we have not done, however, is you know hacked out any of your margin. So the whole idea here is to pass some of those costs downstream, obviously to our end users and to our customers, but we're maintaining your profit margins as well as our own. And at the end of the day, that's why we're all here. So um, let's take a deeper dive here into the new models and what these features offer us. Uh, and again, if you guys have questions about what we're talking about here, happy to run, run through uh, and answer those when we get a chance to. 325ES is really, again, our foundation 4K projector model. True 4K, native uh, SXRD panels, three panel system. So uh, we'll take a deeper dive about some of the benefits of that later on in this presentation. 1500 lumens of brightness. So again, more than bright enough to do screen sizes like 120, probably top out, you know, in a light controlled room, maybe 150 diagonal is probably about as big as I would say is the right a decision to make with this particular projector, but certainly if you're in the 100 to 130 inch kind of range screen size, this thing is gonna be awesome. Uh, you have two different colorways with a 325ES. So we've got a black option or a carbon option, as well as a white uh, solution. So if you're putting this into a niche or you're putting it into a family room or something like that, it's not a big black box hanging off the ceiling. We also have some improvements this year with the addition of the X1 for projector. So if you're familiar with Sony Bravia TV sets from the last you know, seven or eight years or so, you should be familiar with the, with the name X1. We've taken that technology and incorporated it into more of the projectors in our lineup. So uh, we'll take a run through here about what that gives us. But uh, the big takeaways are improved HDR performance with our dynamic HDR enhancer technology, as well as improved upscaling and uh, image recognition and sharpness, et cetera, on screen with our reality creation technology. Another improvement that we've added for this year is separate picture controls for standard dynamic range and high dynamic range settings. So I'll illustrate that later on in the, in the presentation, but really what we're talking about here is you can use one picture mode in the projector, calibrate, calibrate it for SDR, make picture adjustments for SDR, fire up HDR content, make picture adjustments for HDR, and the projector can stay in one picture mode versus uh, in the past where we would have told you to, oh, you should switch, you know, you should give create one for SDR content and one for HDR content and give your customer a button to switch between the two. Um, you and I both know probably that some clients are really challenged with, with uh, decisions and buttons that they have to press. So let's just make it easy and more convenient for them to enjoy content. 
taking a look at the 1025 ES. Uh, this is the replacement for the 995 ES, comes in at $40,000 retail. Uh, again, premium optics are available on this projector. This is uh, our entry level into the skybox seats, uh, as I would like to uh, say uh, colloquially. Uh, it's just sort of my little metaphor for kind of where these are positioned in our lineup. 1025 ES is really the, the first point of entry into our premium category uh, of projector lineup with all glass optics, you know, bigger screen sizes, that sort of stuff. And again, this model also receives the same enhancements of X1 for projector with dynamic HDR enhancer, reality creation, and separate picture memories for SDR and HDR. And I see a few questions popping up here already. Uh, 325 ES is 1500 lumens. Uh, the 715 ES is 1800 lumens. Uh, 1025 ES is native 17 by nine. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about why that is, but it's all about uh, native 4K resolution. Okay, so click back over here. And um, taking a look here at what X1 for projector brings us. It's really about adding in uh, improved HDR performance as well as improved clarity with our reality creation technology. Uh, if you've never done this test before, I would suggest you try it. If you get a Sony projector, you're on site doing an install. Uh, look in the picture menu on the projector and look for the option listed as reality creation. And there's a test mode for on off. Pause an image on the screen and run that test. Uh, and you'll see why that you wanna leave uh, the reality creation feature turned on. It's very noticeable, sharpens up the picture a lot. So above and beyond what we're doing optically, above and beyond what we're doing with the processor, uh, we also have you know an extra layer of sharpness that we're adding here. So it's a concert of uh, components put together to deliver the best picture quality possible. So let's talk a little bit about HDR performance and take a, a look at the Sony's philosophy behind how we do HDR specifically with a projector. So HDR content is obviously not created uh, on a home cinema projector at a customer's house. Uh, it is uh, really done with a color grading monitor in uh, some, you know, Hollywood production suite like Screen Gems or Colorworks or some of those other sorts of uh, post-production houses. And they're using monitors like this to create HDR. Of course, there is a cinematic release, but you know, at the end of the day, when we're talking about uh, consumer content, they're really color grading it for the televisions of the world. Projectors are definitely um, sort of secondary in terms of priority or you know what this content's going to look like. Because let's just face it, there's a bunch more TVs out there than there are projectors, right? So, what does the BVM HX310 have to do? with um, a projector that you might find in a customer's living room with a drop down screen, right? We're talking about completely different technologies, you know, uh, direct RGB OLED versus projection. Uh, we're talking about much smaller screen size, you know, 30 inch monitor over here on the left hand side versus maybe, you know, 120 plus uh, drop down screen over there on the right hand side. So how do we accomplish a similar type of performance with completely dissimilar technology? And the answer to that question is we use processing. So the projector uses its technology. We use a couple of different tricks uh, that are on board the projector to really make sure that we can get as close to the director's intent or what the people are seeing at ColorWorks on that little screen uh, in your customer's living room or customer's home theater, what have you. So we accomplish that obviously using our know-how and the X1 for projector. So we're taking, uh, SDR based analysis to really render HDR properly. We're using advanced signal processing. So we're using Sony know-how to really render the images uh, in as sharp and a detailed way as possible, color brightness, et cetera. And we're using precision modulation of the light engine. So we'll take a deeper dive into what that means. But in, in essence, we can dim the light source, we can add in processing, we can do a bunch of different things um, to really try to maximize the broadest dynamic range possible, deliver the goods in terms of black level, as well as color brightness and you know elevated specular highlights, et cetera. Uh, when we take a look at the improvements of HDR signal analysis and what X1 for projector brings us, it just means that we can sample the picture in much finer detail and much finer gradients. 
so that whether it's a brighter scene like we see here on the top of the of the graph, excuse me, of the illustration here, previous generations was just much bigger steps um, in terms of um, color sampling. Same thing in a dark scene where if it's black, we can't really break down any of the fine, fine detail there. We really have to sort of go with uh, more of a global uh, step view of what the content looks like on screen. But with the new version of X1 for projector, again, we can see that we're doing much finer color sampling, not only in bright scenes, but also in dark scenes. So we can really make sure that we maintain that black level and shadow detail that customers expect. And again, what their director intends you to see uh, when you're watching the movie at home. In a little bit more detail, uh, we can take a look here at what the um, ideal picture quality curve looks like versus what, um, what Sony can do and really how we compare uh, our HDR um, improvements versus what some of our competitors are doing out there with dynamic tone mapping. So if we look at the chart over here on the left-hand side of the screen, this is what would be uh, affectionately referred to as the gold standard for picture representation. So uh, in a color grading suite, we've got somewhere between three to 10,000 nits of brightness. We've also got um, perfect black, right? So we got zero black down here at the bottom and we've got you know extended brightness and elevated uh, light output up here at the top. Uh, and that really follows this golden curve here. However, we know that with a projector, we're not gonna be able to get anywhere near 3,000 to 10,000 nit. And if the projector's on and it's putting light on the screen, we're above zero point black. So we're not actually perfect black. So what does Sony do to really recreate what we're seeing here in the golden curve? So what Sony's doing is we're using uh, the frame average luminance level or the fall of the content. So we're really using the X1 chip to watch what's happening here on a frame by frame basis and really adjust brightness and contrast, black level, et cetera, based on what the content says it's supposed to do. Unlike dynamic tone mapping, where you are setting a target brightness level artificially in, in a lot of cases, um, our, our, uh, our solution or our uh, technology works where we're, again, we're following what the content says to do as opposed to just applying a blanket algorithm that says, hey, I always want you to be at this brightness level and I want you to plug in all the color and grayscale and black, et cetera, to fit into that pocket. That is in essence really recolor grading the movie and ignores what the director's intent is. So Sony's process for dynamic HDR enhancer works like this. We will take and pull down the black level by dimming the light source, whether that's using a dynamic iris uh, with our lamp-based projectors or modulating the, uh, modulating the laser with our laser-based projectors. And then we will enhance the bright areas on screen by using signal processing so that the result at the end of the uh, you know, frame by frame situation is that we're getting much closer to the ideal picture quality, uh, our I ideal picture quality curve. So we know that we're not able to achieve this extra head headroom in terms of brightness so once we top out at our peak brightness, we'll just roll that off there right at the top so that at the end of the day, the result is a much more natural looking picture and something that follows the director's intent uh, more closely than again, dynamic tone mapping. In some situations, and I've seen it firsthand, uh, DTM will make skin tone and make a bunch of stuff look weird on screen where it's like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to elevate the brightness in the background but the projector or the device will see that and go, hey, I've got something on screen that's kind of in this brightness range, so I need to you know, elevate that, which again, can really kind of alter what the content on the screen looks like away from the director's intent. Sony's philosophy is all about let the content dictate what the processing is supposed to do, as opposed to just applying processing over whatever the content does, right? So that's really our philosophy versus what we're seeing uh, from some of our competitors out there. There are pros and cons, of course, to every uh, everything out there. So it's not a perfect solution, but you know, a projector is not uh, directly analogous to what we're seeing uh, on a color grading monitor. So we're trying to get as close to, again, what, our, what the director intends you to see or what the content producers intend you to see uh, using 
uh, the constraints and the limitations of our technology. Yeah, at the end of the day, though, we're really trying to follow that ideal picture quality curve as dictated by the content uh, by using processing and using image and brightness modulation. This is the part of the presentation where I get to plug the comparison slides at the end of this uh, presentation that I'll be doing. So this are some of the, uh, these are some of the comparisons that we've made and documented and stuff that we'll share with you guys here at the end. So if you're a salesperson, a designer, something like that, and you're not worried about these comparison slides, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll press pause on that for now. Uh, when we get to that point, you guys need to jump off. You're more than welcome to. Uh, but I think they're pretty compelling uh, slides and certainly uh, we got some feedback from the earlier presentation on that, some of the other sessions that I've done here. So I feel like this is a really strong representation of some of the benefits that Sony offers, uh, not only from previous generations of our own product, but also benefits of what we have to offer versus some of our competitors out there. To swerve back to some of the other things that were improved by the X1 for projector, we're talking about super resolution reality creation. So um, this is Sony's uh, proprietary algorithm, a proprietary technology that we've been building since 2005. Uh, goes all the way back to the very first digital cinema projectors that uh, were released in 2006, I think, something like that. Uh, and we're really highlighted with, um, sorry, the uh, second edition of the prequel versions of Star Wars. So um, Star Wars 2 Attack of the Clones uh, was really where the very first Sony 4K digital cinema projectors came into their own into the market uh, and were really based around that content, uh, being able to reproduce a cinematic experience over and over and over again and have it be consistent uh, from a digital file as opposed to a film print, which degrades over time. So uh, considering the fact that we've been learning how to fill in the gaps and make content look as beautiful as it's supposed to look, you know, again, per director's intent, uh, we can actually analyze every pixel in any direction on screen. Uh, we can detect faces, uh, textures, shapes, smoke, colors, fine gradients, detail, et cetera. So if the projector notices that, hey, you know, there's a loss in detail here, or this, you know, the shirt on this kid's back just looks kind of weird and it's sort of blending into uh, other things in the, in the, on the screen, or, you know, his hair starting to take on the effect of the wood grain door behind him our technology can actually intelligently decipher what those things are and again, can render them the way that they're supposed to be rendered as opposed to, uh, you know, just what the projector can come up with. So it's really uh, kind of a one-two punch there between our HDR technology as well as our reality creation that's really going to deliver the goods in terms of, again, HDR picture performance as well as general sharpness and overall performance of the projector. If you don't know this already, all Sony projectors are SXRD. So even our HD projectors are SXRD technology. Uh, when we talk about our 4K guys here, they are true 4K imagers, so 4096 by 2160. So there was a question earlier about what's the native aspect ratio of a Sony projector, and it's actually 17 by nine because we follow the architecture and the design of our cinema products. So what does that mean for UHD customers or consumer customers? It just means that there's a little bit of extra re resolution there uh, on the panels if you want to go with a true 17 by 9 screen. That's great. Um, but it also means that uh, we have some flexibility in terms of picture performance and some other things we can do to really uh, tweak the image to suit the, suit the needs of the installation. SXRD is also very high contrast. And as I mentioned before, it's a three panel system. So some of the benefits there really are illustrated here. Um, again, you got your 8.8 .8 million pixels. You got your high native contrast, AKA great black level. Uh, when you compare a SXRD device, uh, three chip system versus single chip DLP, which is basically every single chip DLP projector out there from 2000 bucks, probably going all the way up to, you know, pretty close to six figures. Um, you're going to be a single chip 4K DLP device with a color wheel and all of that sort of stuff. So they really need the contrast enhancement that um, like a gray screen or a black screen can offer them. Sony projector can offer very high native contrast and black level, even on a white screen. Um, and the other benefit to the three panel system is the fact that there's no more effect. There's no rainbows moving across the screen. There's no color wheel. So the projectors are going to be quieter, 
or going to deliver a better overall picture experience. And if you're not familiar with what the rainbow effect I'm talking about or what Mori is, again, if you've seen an inexpensive or even, quite frankly, some more expensive uh, single chip DLP 4K projectors, it's very specific. Uh, and you go into maybe a tech summit or something like that, and you've seen them shot out side by side, take a look at, you know, forty, fifty thousand uh, dollar DLP single chip device, walk into that little demo booth and take a look your eyes left to right, turn your head left to right, and you're going to see rainbows out of the corner of your eye, or you're going to see a diagonal rainbow line passing across the screen. That's all relative to the color wheel and the multiple flashes on screen that those um, imagers have to create. You know, uh, our imagers are true 4096 by 2160. We don't have to flash the screen multiple times to, uh, to achieve 4K or to achieve UHD. So uh, again, these are all benefits in terms of picture performance for, for uh, Sony versus the competition out there. That's why we use uh, SXRD because it has these benefits. No more A effect, great contrast and black level. And again, that true native 4K resolution on screen so that we don't have to do panel manipulation or flash the screen multiple times to achieve uh, a 4K or a UHD experience. And of course, it's not all about um, processing. It's not all about um, you know what the content looks like inside the projector. Uh, I've said this before in some of our earlier presentations, but really the best that the image is gonna look from the projector is on the imager itself before it gets shot out through a lens and onto the wall. And that's gonna be true of every single projector on the market out there. Uh, really from the standpoint of once it's off of the imager and shooting through the air from that point on, it's really damage limitation, right? So the optics are important, the screen material is important, and really Sony's design here is really built to maximize uh, the sweet spot uh, of the uh, of the focus of the lens, as well as the performance on screen. So if we look here uh, at the top of this uh, graph or this illustration, this is what we find with our competitors out there using a conventional spherical lens that really has a bias towards the center of the image. And once you get out past that sweet spot, you're really gonna start to see image, distor image distortion or a loss of focus and again, we're talking about even from multiple focal points, um, you're seeing a little bit of drift out there in the edges. So the takeaway from this graph is like the old days when I was an installer, you had to make sure that you plan the job so that the projector is far enough away from the screen to keep the image in as much of the sweet spot as possible. Sony's design is what they call an aspheric lens. So it's not conventional spherical, it's, it's an aspheric lens, which means we've got angular bevels on the front side and the back side that match each other so that the throughput from a single focal point, which is what we have in our projectors, outputs in a far more uniform manner across the entire surface of the screen. So our narrow blurry part is minimized, if not completely eliminated. Uh, and again, as long as you're not planning for the minimum throw distance, you're going to be pretty much in the sweet spot for the rest of the available throw range out there. So there's my one takeaway from this. If you're not uh, if you're not familiar with projectors and you're you're planning a job, please 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 do not plan for the absolute minimum throw distance. Uh, you know, with the maximum screen size in that room, try to give yourself, uh, you know, even six eight inches or a foot away from the the minimum throw distance. It will pay dramatic dividends in terms of uh, image quality and and picture performance and focus over the entire surface of the screen. So. Um, it's not all about uh, screen material, uh, excuse me, it's not all about lens material. So when we talk about our projector lineup and where we have glass lenses versus where we have plastic lenses or polymer lenses to be uh, more politically correct, we'll just call it plastic because quite frankly, that's what they are. It's really, really high grade plastic because we have the same uh, lenses from $20,000 down to, you know, $5,500. So literally the same lens that you would find in a 325 ES is the same lens that you'll find in the 915 ES at 20,000 bucks. So it's the main components that are really important. It's really just those steps and technology behind the scenes that are really the separating points between uh, where our projectors are positioned price-wise and performance-wise. So again, the big takeaway here in our lower power units, 
the construction or the, the type of materials that are used in the lenses is not as critical as making sure that you've got the right lens design to maximize the performance and focal area uh, on screen. When you talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, our more powerful uh, projectors, so the 1025 VW5000 and of course the GTZ380, we know that you're gonna be going in with bigger screen sizes, right? So the bigger you make that image, this is where having the all glass optics are really gonna separate the performance between a 915 and a 1025 ES, let's say. So uh, to draw out a, a quick illustration, maybe you're having a conversation with a customer between, you know, what's the difference between the 915 and the 1025 ES? We're talking about $20,000 retail. What do I get for my 20 grand? On paper, it doesn't look like a whole lot. If you were talking a smaller screen size, let's say 120 inches uh, diagonal, 16 by nine, if you put a 915 and a 1025 side by side on the same size screen, the only thing that you would really notice is the brightness difference between the two. 1025 ES is 2200 lumens versus 2000 lumens on the 915. And on the same screen size, smaller, like a 120 or whatever, you're not gonna see much difference in terms of sharpness or focus between the two, you know, if at all. Really, again, the only thing that you would notice is a little bit of extra brightness on the 1025. Now, if you make that same comparison on a 150 or 160 inch diagonal 16 by nine screen, now we're talking about the ArcF lens really coming into its own because now you're blowing up those pixels to be much, much bigger on a bigger screen in a bigger area, maybe sitting at different focal lengths to the screen. Uh, this is where the ArcF lens really pays dividends and that's why we have that separation in terms of performance. Uh, we're using very similar design ideas, again, as spheric lenses and stuff like that that are built into the ArcF lens. This lens has really dictated the design of the lower end uh, projector units that use polymer or plastic lenses in it. So we take that same design philosophy with great performance, great construction, and we have it built into the fact that, um, you know, we've got different flavors for uh, for different palettes, I guess we'd say. So the big benefit, just as a reminder here, the big benefit to the ArcF lens is really going to come through the bigger the screen that you go, you're going to need that extra brightness. And because of that bigger screen, you're going to want the extra performance that the ArcF lens <clears throat> offers versus our polymer lenses. On top of all of that, um, we have another piece of damage limitation uh, built into our projectors. Every, mod every one of our projectors in our lineup, except for the 325, has this feature, and it's turned on by default. It's called Digital Focus Optimizer. And again, when we're talking about maximizing the sweet spot on screen, <clears throat> even if you're uh, maybe a little bit closer than you should be to the screen, um, or you're in an environment where you know it's just, just a situation where... Um, you're trying to maximize the sharpness and the focus over the entire surface area of the screen. The DFO or digital focus optimizer feature does that. So the projector and the processor knows where certain distortion can occur based on the position of the lens. And if it sees any of that, or if it, it gets triggered by where we're at in terms of zoom position, et cetera, it will add in this extra layer of uh, digital focus optimization so that again, the corners are just as sharp as the center of the image. So we can get away from making sure that the projector is more than, you know, 50% of the throw distance away from the screen, et cetera. You don't have to worry so much about being in the sweet spot because generally by and large, <clears throat> the bulk of the throw distance is the sweet spot with our technology, with our lens design, and as well as our processing added on top of it. So this is a question that I get asked a bunch in a lot of presentations um, by customers as well as dealers. What are the benefits of the laser other than it costs more money and I make more money selling it? Um, there's a bunch of them and things that you guys should maybe take with you if you're talking to customers about um, a laser-based projector versus lamp-based. You get consistent brightness and color over the life of the unit because again, it's laser phosphor, so it's not gonna degrade as quickly as a lamp. Uh, smooth dynamic contrast, Again, when we're talking about our HDR performance there and modulating the light source with a lamp, you can't do a cold stop on it and then 
uh, another cold restart, right? Like you can't really modulate the lamp on and off like that, like you can with a laser. A laser, you can turn it off on and off a bunch of times every second if you want to, to improve that black level and improve that dynamic contrast. Lamp-based projector just can't do that. Uh, 20,000 hours with virtually no maintenance. So no filters to change, no lamp changes to make, no added cost down the road to operate the projector. And ultimately it comes down to convenience, right? How many times have we done installs for customers that are like, yeah, you know, we have a theater, we have a projector, but we never use it because it takes too long to turn on. And, you know, picture's not that great. It's not, you know, it's not as good as my TV. You know, laser projection really gets a whole lot closer to the performance of a flat panel level uh, type of capability. So fast on, fast off operation, the, the comparison we wanna make there is the fact that you can turn the projector on and be at full brightness in about 18 seconds. A lamp-based projector is somewhere between 60, 90 to 120 seconds, could be up to two minutes before the lamp comes up to full brightness. Uh, laser does not have that issue. And then again, fast off operation. So you turn the projector off and it's 23 seconds. The projector runs the fan, cools itself off, and again, can go up in a ceiling lift or just be you know, turned off and ready for the, for the next time you're gonna have a movie night or what have you. So uh, there are a bunch of benefits to laser above and beyond picture performance. It's also convenience, uh, cost of ownership over the life of the unit. So benefits of laser are pretty dramatic. And I think probably where we're gonna see uh, most, if not all the industry shift uh, to laser projection at some point down the road. But uh, at this point, to get into the laser uh, category of the projector lineup from Sony, you're talking about a $20,000 ask or more uh, to get uh, into that category. Uh, VZ1000, yes, the short throw projector is actually 15 grand, but and it actually does have the same benefits of laser here, but uh, by and large, we're talking about two-piece projection uh, you know, standard long distance type of situation, not short throw. Um, Sony projectors are relatively compact uh, compared to uh, our competition out there. And really just to highlight this, 715ES, um, again, relatively speaking, is a pretty compact unit, runs pretty quiet. Uh, our lamp-based projectors are front ventilating. So you can put them in a niche, you can put them in a pocket that has a closed back uh, and they will ventilate to the front. So 325 and 715 ES can both be put literally like in a niche in a wall or something like that, that's closed at the back. As long as the front of it's open and, and free uh, to ventilate the hot air out, you'd be good to go. You won't have any issues there. 915 ES and the rest of our uh, lineup that's laser is axial cooling. So it will draw air in the front and blow it out the back. So um, you need to make sure that you're not restricting that airflow in that respect, but again, compared to our competition at the same brightness level or price level, Sony projectors are quieter, uh, run cooler, and again, far more flexible in terms of installation uh, as a result. Saw a question pop up here in chat. I just want to click on it here and see if it's something I can answer. So what happens after the 20,000 hours on a laser-based projector? You know, that's a great question. <clears throat> the, um, the, the, let's kind of take a look at it here from a pragmatic standpoint. If you look at 20,000 hours, that's really amounts to five hours a day, every day of the year for eight years before you hit that, or you hit that point of time. Uh, or you could leave it on for roughly three years, 24 <laughs> seven, if that's what you want to do. Um, you have that option as well. So at the 20,000 hour mark, uh, you could replace the light engine and the projector, certainly uh, something that's serviceable. It's not something you can do in the field, but it's something you could have done uh, at the Sony service center. But let's take a look at the calendar, right? If we're talking about five to eight years from now, and we'll just, we'll go ahead and round up, we'll just call it eight years from now because your customer uses the projector like a TV. What are they gonna do at that point? Really what we're talking about is the fact that um, we can't, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's not, uh, there's probably not gonna be a direct replacement uh, from, from uh, you know, from a component standpoint but you probably wanna take a look at what's available out there uh, in the market eight years from now before you maybe wanted to put money into repairing uh, this particular unit. Again, you're gonna have that option, I would imagine, but it's definitely something to keep in mind when uh, we're talking about you know, what happens at the 20,000 hour mark. It's not like the projector's just gonna conk out and say, sorry, 20,000 hours were closed. 
uh, you really just reached the point where you're at half brightness and you're not going to be able to really um, be able to render a picture at the same quality or the same brightness that you would uh, when the projector was new, right? So thinking about it from that standpoint, at the 20,000 hour mark, you'd probably want to be realistically looking at what your alternatives are uh, for a replacement. Or again, if you want to repair it, I think that would also be an option. I saw the other question there about ventilation. How much ventilation should we have? You really want to have, you know, six inches plus in every direction of the projector if it's in an enclosure or something like that. So you'd want to have six inches behind it, six inches to the left, six inches to the right, uh, six inches top and bottom, something like that. Obviously, if it's in free air, not going to be an issue, but uh, you really want to make sure that you avoid uh, having hot air build up behind the projector and have the front of the unit being able to re-ingest that heated air and elevate the temperature inside the unit. That's not what we want to do. So, uh, you know, six inches or more in every direction is going to make you uh, and your customers and the projector a happy camper. And you can uh, adjust that air volume in different ways. So if you're a little bit tighter on the left and the right, but you can get more room uh, at the back or top and bottom, uh, that air volume is really, you know, configurable in, in different ways, if you will. So you can position the projector in different areas within that uh, open space or within that enclosure uh, to make sure that, again, stays nice and cool and happy. Okay, click back here on the presentation so I can click ahead. Uh, you can absolutely game on a Sony projector because we, um, we are a gaming company out there. So we have a feature called input lag reduction that's built into uh, all of our projectors at this point. And you can game at 4K HDR 60p. With the input lag reduction turned on, you're somewhere around 80 milliseconds. So that's about, let's see, three and a half, four frames of video of lag roughly uh, when we're talking about processing. Um, and then with the input lag reduction turned off, or excuse me, turned on, uh, you're roughly 27 milliseconds. So about a frame and a half of video compared to what you would see uh, on a flat panel television per, roughly. So. Um, they're not HDMI 2.1, we're not G-Sync, we're not VRR. Uh, those are all very competitive gaming type features, uh, but let's just kind of call it what it is. A lot of customers, uh, specifically competitive gamers, are not going to be uh, expecting to game out uh, online versus a competition uh, using a 150 inch screen, right? They're using like a 40 inch gaming monitor or uh, high performance television, something like that, so that they can keep the complete field of view uh, within their, you know, within their visual range. So, you know, kind of looking at it from how the real world looks at uh, looks at these things, I would say, uh, if the question is, can I game on a Sony projector? And the absolute question is yes, and it's a very immersive experience. Racing sims, golf sims, that sort of kind of things are fantastic um, on a large projector or a large projection screen. I don't know about first person shooter. Uh, that might make you a little bit ill, <laughs> but I know uh, from firsthand experience from uh, trying uh, Gran Turismo on a 120 inch screen with the, you know, with the projector and a PlayStation controller, very immersive, very real world type of experience for driving sims and stuff like that. Here's a quick illustration of what we were talking about for SDR versus HDR. Um, with the previous generations of our projectors, again, we would have told you to calibrate two different picture modes, one for HDR and one for SDR content. And, you know, that was a fine solution, I guess, really at our, uh, <coughs> the emphasis, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I'm trying not to die here, uh, doing a lot of talking today, so I apologize for that. Uh, but we would have told you to calibrate two separate picture modes, one for HDR and one for SDR. That's fine, but it's not very convenient, right? So the new models have incorporated a feature for separate picture memories for HDR as well as SDR. So again, you can calibrate Cinema Film 1 if that's what you want to do, uh, fire up some HDR content, make your picture adjustments, make it look great, then fire up a separate um, bit of content on the same picture mode that's SDR. So the illustration here is like the newest version of Spider-Man versus... Uh, the Matrix, which is, you know, from the 90s, <laughs> so well before HDR was even uh, even considered to be a thing. And your customer doesn't have to change picture modes, doesn't have to do anything to enjoy the content the way that it's supposed to look. It's just automatic. So a nice, nice little nod to convenience and, and uh, ease of operation there, improved performance over the life of the unit. 
And for dealers or customers that are looking for a little bit of extra sizzle added on top, we have a feature called HDR reference. So our automatic decode mode is always going to be HDR 10. There are no long throw two piece projectors that are certified by Dolby Labs for Dolby Vision. The only projectors that you'll see out there on the market uh, that will support Dolby Vision are ultra short throw projectors because they know Dolby Labs knows what the maximum screen size is. So they can actually build in um, some, some, uh, sorry, some, some color graving, uh, some color grading and some tone mapping to make sure that they can deliver a Dolby acceptable level of performance um, on, on those particular pieces of technology. When you're talking about a long throw projector and they don't know what the screen size is gonna be at Dolby, they're not interested in certifying any projectors to do that because there could be a combination that doesn't work for Dolby Vision and that makes Dolby look bad, right? So um, that's just not something that they've done yet. So what Sony's added in here is an extra level of processing to our HDR performance called HDR reference. So that we are doing again, frame by frame dynamic tone mapping to deliver an even richer black level, uh, even richer color detail, et cetera, uh, in HDR reference mode versus HDR 10. Um, I would say HDR 10 is probably the most uh, direct throughput from what the content creators expected you, the con excuse me, what the content creators expect the content to look like versus what's going to happen on screen. But if you're looking for a little bit more, your customer's looking for a little bit more, we have this extra option here called HDR reference so that uh, if you want to give them, again, a little bit of extra pop, a little bit of extra black level, we have that capability in all the projectors listed here, uh, as you see on screen. So to summarize here, uh, kind of where we're at um, in our lineup, 325 ES, 1500 ANSI lumens, again, two different colorways, lamp-based projector, uh, improved performance this year from X1 for projector uh, that we're gonna, that we've talked about here a lot already. Uh, but again, this is where uh, our projector lineup starts in 4K. So we've got, again, those foundation features built in. 715 ES is 1800 ANSI lumens at $10,000 retail. It's a little bit more, you know, a little bit brighter versus the model that, uh, excuse me, versus the 325 ES. We still have those two different colorways, white and carbon. Uh, we do get some step ups in terms of feature set that continue on through the rest of the lineup as we go up. So picture position or lens memory, whatever you want to call it. So we can set up different zoom, different focus options for different screen sizes and aspect ratios, uh, improved uh, black level with our advanced iris technology, digital focus optimizer, and of course, all of the other things that you guys have come to find and expect uh, in a Sony projector like IP control, serial control, uh, quiet operation, et cetera. All of those things live in all of our projectors, but those extra advanced features really start from the 715ES and work their way on up. <clears throat> Moving up into the 915ES, and again, this is really that comparison that we were talking about before. What do I get uh, when I go from the 715 lamp-based model at $10,000 uh, to the 915ES at $20,000. Again, you're getting extra brightness at 2,000 lumens. You're getting the laser light engine that we talked about here. Again, the benefits of X1 for projector, all of the benefits that we talked about with the with the laser versus lamp story really are really you know decided between these two models in our lineup. So uh, is it worth double the money? I think that's obviously up to you and up to your customers to decide. But when we talk about lamp replacements and we talk about performance and usability over the life of the unit <clears throat> and those other points that I uh, illustrated, I think the 915ES is um, definitely worthy of consideration. And I think you're getting what you pay for at that point. Moving on into the Skybox seats, when we're talking about the higher end models in our lineup. New model, of course, 1025 replaces the 995 ES, 2200 ANSI lumens, gets the new X1 for projector, so improved HDR performance, improved upscaling technology, but also this is where the premium optics and interchangeable lens uh, capability comes into our lineup. So from this point on, all the projectors will have different lens options. Again, we'll have that improved performance uh, that those that offers so you can go with a bigger screen uh, without the image penalty that goes along with that, like you might find with uh, some of the uh, polymer-based lensing that we have in our lower uh, end projectors. 
Uh, the VW 5000 ES at 5000 lumens, $60,000 retail. Again, this guy has been the flagship projector in our lineup up until, uh, let's see, September, October of last year, something like that. So um, it's really the the big boy that just got uh, got replaced by an even bigger boy. There's a, there's a bigger bully on the street, I guess, uh, at this point. So uh, still in our lineup, still has a lot of big benefits, of course, you know, with the extra brightness and the support for the full DCI color space. And then moving up to the GTZ 380, and I apologize if you guys hear the FedEx truck roll up here to the truck or to my garage here right now, slash my studio, uh, getting a delivery right now. So I apologize for any uh, audible distractions that you might hear in the background, but GTZ 380, uh, 10,000 ANSI lumens, uh, totally different classification of projector uh, than Sony's offered before at this level. Uh, to kind of give you an idea, this projector could do 500 plus nits uh, on a four meter wide screen. So we're talking about what a 14 ish, almost foot wide screen being able to reproduce the same kind of brightness levels that you would find uh, on an, on a 65 inch OLED TV, right? So we're not talking about peak brightness. We're talking about average brightness level is somewhere between, you know, 400 to 500 nits, maybe 350 to 450 nits on an OLED TV. So we've got a projector that can make uh, OLED levels of brightness uh, on a screen that's, you know, maybe 12 to 14, 15 foot wide. So really a different level in terms of performance capability with this particular product. GTC 380 is available to distribution customers. All of our distributor partners, uh, the Snap AV family, have gone through the process to get their FDA variants in order for you as dealers to be able to sell and install GTZ 380, you also need to go through the FDA variance process. It takes about two weeks to get uh, the paperwork done and completed. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, uh, this is a product that you guys can offer uh, your customers just like uh, a lot of our direct dealers can and do. So if you have customers that are in that price range, it says $80,000 excludes lens. So it's really 88 grand for the standard lens or 93 grand for the uh, short throw lens. Uh, and we are working on some other lens options there. We have a lot of capability uh, built into this box and a lot of performance built into this box. So you can think about putting this projector outside of just the home theater space, right? With that kind of brightness level uh, and the right screen, the right environment, uh, you could reproduce or recreate uh, the same brightness performance levels that large LED walls, et cetera, uh, would have and do it for much less money uh, without, you know, even a permanent installation, if that's what you wanted to do, right? Like if this was something that was temporary, uh, something you were putting up for a short period of time or, or what have you, you have the flexibility that a projector offers with the same performance capability of us, you know, again, a large LED wall or a, a large OLED television. So really exciting uh, capability there. Uh, GTZ 380 also supports 100% DCI P3 with no loss in brightness. So big, uh, big step up in performance with this particular model uh, and a, you know, a game changer, if you will, for, uh, for our Sony projector lineup. So quick look here again at the complete lineup from top to bottom or bottom to top, I guess, from, from that perspective. Uh, we still make an HD lamp-based projector, the six, excuse me, HW65ES. Uh, literally there's been a version of that projector in our lineup since I started with the company a decade ago. HW65ES comes in at $3,000 retail. 325ES, again, those two different colorways, improvements with the X1 for a projector comes in at $5,500. 715ES benefits from those same upgrades. So it also has uh, X1 for projector inside it, comes in at $10,000 retail. <clears throat> 915ES is our first step into uh, our laser uh, lineup. So it comes in at $20,000 retail. Uh, but I mentioned before when we were talking about lensing, same optics from $20,000 down to $5,500. Uh, when we move up to the 1025 ES, we come in at $40,000 retail. And again, all the benefits of the Arc F lens and then improved brightness for larger screen sizes. That's really where that projector is positioned. Uh, the VPL VZ 1000 ES is still our premium laser ultra short throw projector. 2,500 ANSI lumens, 1500 or excuse me, $15,000 retail allow you to do a 120 inch screen at about six to eight inches off of the wall, roughly. So 
different level of performance uh, for doing two piece projection uh, than really anybody's <laughs> anybody else has out there. It's a totally different animal uh, than some of our competitors at the in the UST space. Uh, and then of course our flagship models, VW 5000 ES at $60,000 and the GTZ 380 at somewhere between 88 and $93,000 respectively, depending on the lens option that you choose. So this is the part where I get to say, uh, if you need to sign off or jump off of this presentation, uh, your sales guy, you got other stuff to do. Great, you know, I think, uh, or you're a technical person and uh, you're, you don't need to illustrate some of the differences for your clients. Um, I think, uh, you know, this is the point where we're gonna move into some of the comparisons. I see a question popped up here in chat. How many, will you have any sub K, sub 4K projectors going forward? Uh, if you maybe missed that, Greg, we just have one. We just have the, uh, the HW65 um, at $3,000 retail. Okay, so taking a look at our shootout that we did here to compare uh, Sony projectors against each other versus some of our competition out there. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Nobu-san went through great lengths to make sure that this comparison was conducted in as fair a manner as we possibly could. So we're seeing, again, all the projectors lined up in the lab here, all shot on the same, same screen from the same sources, same splitters, same cables. So nobody got an advantage based on signal path. Nobody got an advantage based on content or any of those other things, cables, what have you all based around same as same input uh, to compare directly the output. Same thing that we did with our 325 shootout environment, same camera shot, uh, the same projectors in a rack in the same lab. So they all had the same, <laughs> they all had the same performance um, uh, obstacles uh, that they had to overcome in this particular setting. My God, the white walls, the white room, the white ceiling, the fluorescent lights. I, I couldn't think of a more, um, unfriendly projector <laughs> shootout uh, environment to shoot in, but fair is fair, right? They're all shot on the same devices in the same space. We also used uh, settings that would really mimic what you would guys, what we typically find uh, that you guys are doing out there in the field. You're, unless the customers are paying for absolute calibration and those sort of things, you guys are making some simple adjustments to the projectors on screen so that you guys can get maximum performance with minimal input. And Sony makes that really, really easy. Our competitors have some other options here. So basically what we did was updated the firmware on them, turned on the, the competitive features directly so that we could compare the, excuse me, we could compare the projectors directly to each other based on input signal. Uh, Epson's listed here on this sheet as well. I'll just go ahead and tell you right now that I did not include the, that comparison in these slides. Uh, I'll let you know, uh, no spoiler alerts here, but uh, Sony does pretty well uh, versus <laughs> versus Epson uh, in virtually uh, every space and every bit of comparison here. So we may not win on the price point or the free lamp or the free mount included in the box, uh, but you guys make money selling all those extra options. So uh, why not sell something that's pretty close in price point that gives you the ability to uh, tack in some of those higher margin accessories. So comparing the 1025 to the 995 ES, um, this is Sony versus Sony, and it really kind of illustrates some of the differences between last year's model and the new edition for this year. 995 ES here on the right-hand side of the screen, 1025 over here on the left-hand side. And what you can see here, of course, is better color volume, better color brightness, better color detail. You know, the fire in the fire monster's eyes, this fire or this lightning bolt that's running down his body, even the background, the smoke and the, the details around the fire monster here are just richer and, and better detailed than what we're finding here on the 995ES. So this is the performance improvement that we see uh, from one model series to the next, uh, talking about Sony versus Sony. When we compare the 1025 to the NX9, I need to go ahead here and qualify this comparison before I make it there's probably not a lot of crossover customers between a sub $20,000 JVC and a $40,000 uh, Sony, right? So probably, maybe not, but probably different customers between those two because of the drastic difference in price point. But some things that we can illustrate or some things that we can glean from this comparison are a few here. First and foremost, the NX9 is the latest and greatest um, in terms of what JVC has to offer for image processing, optics, 
Uh, you know, they tout all glass lenses, all of those things together. Uh, the NX9 is, you know, the best that they have to offer uh, pretty much in terms of technology being the latest and greatest that they that they have on the market. So other difference between these two units is the 1025 ES is a laser-based projector, NX9 and all the JVC projectors in this comparison are lamp-based units. So what we're seeing here is theater optimizer off versus on. This is their frame adapt uh, technology. And I personally have studied this slide several times and it's really, really hard to see much of any difference between what that feature set delivers to this projector. Um, but what I would say here is if we're looking at a comparison between what does a lamp-based projector look like versus what a laser-based projector looks like, that is the clear takeaway from this comparison that you see here in this slide. So the laser, of course, we can modulate it. We can enhance black level. We can give you that improved color brightness because we have much finer control over the light engine where with a lamp-based projector, we just don't have that level of control. So they're not able to accomplish the same black level, the same color brightness, et cetera, through processing or otherwise. It's just, they're apples and oranges. And I think in this particular case, apples are gonna win uh, that comparison. Another thing that um, we wanna talk about here is the fact that uh, you know manufacturers make choices when it comes to tuning uh, of their products. And JVC and Sony have very clearly made different choices when it comes to uh, the biases in our projectors. So JVC is touted as having fantastic black level. And I'll say very clearly that I think they do. I think they have probably one of the best black level capabilities right out of the box out there on the market. But you don't get anything for free in this world and there's always compromises as a result. So when we're talking about you guys taking the projectors out of the boxes, doing a couple of quick adjustments to get the picture looking as good as you possibly can. I think that's fairly universal uh, in a lot of cases. And some of the trade-off that JVC has here uh, with the NX9 or their, their color tuning is a far more green bias or a green cast here. Um, I'm pretty sure that Superman's not supposed to get sick. Um, you know, he's supposed to be immune to all kinds of things except for kryptonite, but it looks like he's got a maybe a mild case of the flu or pneumonia going here. He's definitely got um, some green bias happening here on his face. So that black level looks great, but it definitely doesn't come without a cost. On the Sony side of things, we are far more red biased. If you've ever calibrated a Sony projector, uh, you've seen a Sony projector, it's gonna have more of a red bias to it right out of the box. And the benefits to that are, guess what? Improved skin tone, improved flesh tone, improved color brightness in that color spectrum. So um, again, I think the, uh, the takeaway from this particular comparison is if you're not calibrating, you really don't have to change. You don't have to chase skin tone or flesh tone when it comes to Sony. That's really where, uh, you know, our red bias is going to pay dividends and you can make some small adjustments, incremental adjustments to improve your black level, et cetera, as opposed to black being the ultimate goal here and then trying to tailor and make adjustments to the picture to get back some of the natural looking flesh tone that we see here on screen. The other comparison that we're gonna make here is far more real world. Again, 325 uh, ES versus 295 ES. And again, 325 ES versus the JVC NX5. That's a far more real world comparison. So the improvements that we're seeing in HDR performance from the 295 ES to the 325 ES, I wouldn't say they're night and day but they are definitely noticeable. You see here uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, we're seeing better color brightness uh, and some of the finer detail here uh, in the fire monster, the eyes, the fine cracking of his skin. I have never seen a fire monster. I probably don't ever want to, uh, but if I did see one, I think it would probably look more like the one here on the left uh, versus the one on the right. But when we compare the 325 ES versus the NX5 uh, and their theater optimizer versus our frame adapt, uh, excuse me, our contrast, or excuse me, our dynamic HDR enhancer, too many, uh, too many algorithms and too many, uh, shall we say, acronyms floating around in my head to uh, get it all out here straight. I apologize for that. But looking at the images here with the optimizer turned on versus our built-in technology, you'll notice that the background here is elevated almost to the same brightness as the fire monster himself, where you're seeing a little bit better black level and a little bit better and more controlled shadow detail here in the background. This is where dynamic tone mapping really sort of tends to fall off a little bit because again, 
you're trying to render images on screen at a, at a target brightness level, as opposed to rendering images on screen the way that the director wants you to see them on screen. So um, I think that uh, JVC makes a great product just like Sony does. But when we're talking about uh, some of the nuance and some of the finer details that really uh, stand out in terms of what are the benefits of Sony versus JVC, we're not buying anything off the shelf. We're not relying on third party uh, technology producers out there to come up with uh, content or come up with devices to render images the way that the director intends you to see it, right? We're doing all of our technology in-house in collaboration with not only the engineers at Sony, but also the content producers out there in the world to render content the way that they expect you to see it. Last slide that I've got for you here in this comparison is one that we we'll use year over year, uh, and we're gonna continue to use it because our co competition is not fixed, some little subtle details like this that you see here. So 325ES versus the NX5. If you've been to a CDO show, you've been to some of my trainings, you've probably seen this comparison. But for whatever reason, their processing and their, their image detection cannot pick out the fact that there are actually three separate light elements on the screen here in the uh, in the floodlight in the interrogation scene here. If you look at this movie on a television, every television out there on the market will show those three little points of light in this movie. For whatever reason, none of our competition from any manufacturer has been able to figure out a way to render those little dots out of the screen, or if they can, it's really dramatically affected some other part of the image quality. This particular slide is not gonna change the plot of the movie. It's not gonna change any of the perception that you see watching the movie, but what it does do is it illustrates Sony's dedication to making sure that what the people that made this content want you to see is what you're gonna see on screen. And it's absolutely gonna be as close a representation to their intent as physically possible uh, with the technology that we have available. And that is the end of the slides and the presentation that I have here for everybody today. So yeah, fascinating. That that's really a compelling uh, you know illustration right there, right there. It's it's it almost seems like the competition in a way is just uh, try, uh, just making up its own decisions in in a sense. Yeah, you know, I think it really just comes down to you know Sony's legacy and our history with content production, right? Like we make television, we make movies. If you don't know this, they shoot virtually all of the Netflix shows on Sony Pictures lot in Culver City. Uh, the post-production happens there. So we've got a, neat, a unique kind of overlap of creators and engineers and technologists that are trying to say, hey, like what can we do to come up with the best uh, solution possible? So, right. you know, and again, we're not buying it off the shelf. We're developing it in-house. So sometimes that costs a little bit more, but you get what you pay for, I think, in that respect. Uh, Greg, uh, you're welcome. And thank you to uh, Jason Savage. Absolutely. So yeah, I know you got a hard stop here in, in about a minute. So uh, yep. Jason, thank you so much. I mean, if you look at the whole day today, uh, almost 150 dealers. Uh, and thank you for, uh, you know, kind of detailing what we've been through on the technical side of things from your trainings to sure. be able to service our Snap AV local customers, which is important. Um, so we're, we're talking the language as well, taught by the best. Um, those projectors are, are completely awesome. And let's start talking spec work. Uh, Jason's going to give me uh, the deck and some, some more tools to get to you on Friday morning. Uh, so I'm going to do my normal follow-up email. But uh, let's continue the conversation over the next week and a half. I really want to know what you guys are doing, what you're up against. Um, and I will uh, get you the pathway to uh, the experts uh, for, that are here for your disposal. Uh, thanks Absolutely. for the webinar from Greg. Okay, we got that one. And uh, yes, the recording. Uh, yes, Friday morning, I'll render this. I have both sessions and the slide deck with what he can give me. Of course, not the comparison because we don't need to go down that road, right? No, no I'm not going to, we're not here to, <laughs> we're not here to throw rocks at anybody. Um, we do have this recorded. So it's not like uh, they don't know that we're saying these things out there. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure they're saying a bunch of bad stuff about me personally, as, as well as professionally. So, you know what, um, you know, very, you know, barring those slides, we will definitely include uh, the comparison slides from Sony to Sony so that you can, you know, illustrate to your customers or maybe illustrate to your own mind, okay, what are the benefits from last year versus this year? And you can take those and take those points and articulate them to your customers when you're pitching this stuff to them.
Absolutely. All right. Uh, great tool for us for the tool bag. All right. Going forward, Jason, thank you guys so much. Everybody. Uh, yeah. Great day of dealer training for uh, Sony projectors. Uh, look for my email on Friday morning. I will be back next Wednesday uh, with episode. We're going to do uh, uh, the core uh, uh, system is out and uh, uh, the mini DVRs as well. We're going to be uh, talking about we're going to have the experts from Snap on, on the show next week. Uh, from all of us at the Snap AV Locals, can't thank you enough. You will see Jason and I at some point over the late summer, probably. Who knows? But we will let's, get out there to you. So. <laughs> if not late summer, we'll see you at fall. And, you know, if I mentioned before, we will be at Cedia physically this year. Um, but if you're not making your way out to Indianapolis, um,